much for having me and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I'm excited that you all want to join us and learn more about the ancient art form of henna. I'm sure many of you have heard of henna and have probably even had henna done. It's pretty mainstream nowadays. You can get it done at the Ren Fair, even at Cedar Point, um, at street fairs and art fairs, and occasionally the zoo also has henna artists. So there's a lot of opportunities to have henna done. There's a lot of local artists in the Metro Detroit area that are very wonderful. So if you haven't had henna done, I hope you reach out to one of the local artists or find it at a street fair or another venue and have the opportunity to have henna. It's a wonderful experience. So what is henna? If you're not familiar with the plant or the art form, um, it might be a little confusing with the name. So henna is actually a plant. The botanical name is Lazonia enormis, and it is a small flowering tree or shrub actually that grows in many countries. There are many henna traditions around the world, including in North and East Africa, in the Middle East, and in South Asia. So you'll hear about henna from Morocco, um, India, Pakistan, many of those areas of the world is where henna is used most traditionally. But of course, nowadays, it's really spread worldwide and you'll find it all over. There are many words for henna. Um, some of these include uh, along with henna, mendi, mehendi, and even camphor is used to refer to henna. And the word for the art form and the word for the plant are the same. So when you see someone with henna on, you're going to call that henna, but you're also going to call the plant that it comes from henna. If you're looking to research it more, and you just do a quick Google search, you'll come up with much information on both the art form, the plant, um, as well as the henna powder that you can purchase. So talking about different traditions of henna, you can see here four uh, much different styles, and there's even more than this out there. But the first one on your left is a very traditional Indian style of henna. You'll see this often for um, brides, different parties, things like that. So it's a very often very dense filled in designs and that's again a very traditional Indian style of henna. The one next to that going from left to right is what is often called an Indo-Arabic style where it's kind of a combination of Indian and Arabic style, that strip that goes across the hand, either on the back or on the palm. And this is a pretty popular design that you'll see at street fairs as well. The next one moving over to the right is a mandali. And you'll see henna designs in this style very often as well, um, from small flower-like mandalis to much larger intricate mandali. And then the final one on the right is a more modern style. Because henna has become more worldwide and more mainstream, you see designs really of anything you can imagine nowadays. So it's gone from the traditional, which you'll often find, to really, again, any design that you can think of. And because it is an art form and began as an art form, you'll often see art pulled from other pieces in different cultures within henna designs as well. So where is henna from? Well, henna really is one of the most ancient known cosmetics. It's researched back to the time of the mummies in Egypt. And it's believed that that's where the henna plant originated as well as in the area of Egypt. It grows best in warm, arid climates. It doesn't like too much humidity or too much moisture. So you're gonna find it in those areas of the world that are warm, but tend to stay drier, maybe have more monsoon rains at one particular time of the year, but not a steady rainfall 
throughout the year. Currently, you find henna commercially produced in India, Pakistan, Yemen, Iran, and Morocco. So all of that area of the world. And if you look at this map, the areas that are orange are really where henna grows the best and where you find it growing commercially. How does henna grow? This is a plant that I grew and I've attempted growing henna a few times. Unfortunately, henna does not grow very well in Michigan. It loves our summers, but it doesn't do very well in the winter. And I no longer have this or a few of the other plants that I've tried to grow, but I will try again. So again, the henna plant, Lazonia inermis, really likes warm, arid climates and climates that stay that way year round. So our season changes are very harsh on henna plants. It will wilt and even die if the nighttime temperatures fall below 50 degrees. Henna really thrives in the summer heat of 120 degrees up to 120 degrees. And it grows better, again, in more dry soil than damp soil. So areas that don't get as much rainfall and stay warm, but not too wet, produce the best henna. Henna that comes from the hottest and driest climates tends to have more dye in the leaves. And we'll talk a little bit next about the dye in the plant. So how does henna stain? The leaves of the henna plant have a dye molecule called lawzone. And when the leaves are dried and crushed and mixed with liquid, they can then release this dye that attaches to the keratin in your skin. This dye will safely stain your skin in a red-orange range. It can go from a pale orange all the way to a near almost burgundy black. It won't get true black. It's still that red, more reddish burgundy color, but it can get very dark depending on the climate when you have the henna on, how long you have the henna on, and where you have the henna applied to on your body. The stain starts out as a light orange stain when the paste is first removed and then darkens over time. Because the henna attaches to the keratin in the skin, just in the uppermost layers of your skin, your stain then will fade as your skin exfoliates. On the left, you'll see an example of the different stages of a henna stain. The first on the left is with the paste still on, so right after the design has been applied. The next one, you see that light to bright orange stain that is right after the paste is removed. About 24 hours later, the stain darkens a little bit more, and then 36 to 48 hours is when the henna stain reaches its full maturity. After that, how well and how long your henna stain lasts can depend on how you care for it. We'll talk a little bit more about aftercare later on, um, but the more you baby the henna stain, the longer it's going to last, the longer your color is going to last. As you wash your hands and your skin exfoliates, it's going to start to fade and you almost get a bit of a reverse of what you saw as the stain was maturing, where it will start to lighten and then you'll see different areas removed from the skin. The next picture on the right shows you just how dark some parts of the henna stain can get. So you can see those um, more filled in areas on the palm are very, very dark, almost black, and on the fingertips as well. So areas where your skin is thickest are going to stain the best. Palms of the hands, the soles and the sides of the feet really take stain the best because there's more layers of skin for the dye to release into and attach to the keratin. Where your skin is thinner, backs of the hands, your arms, and then moving toward your core, it doesn't stain as well. And henna really doesn't stain necks and faces very well, um, as well as stomachs or lower back, quite as well as it does hands and feet, just because your skin is not as thick there.
Along with staining skin, henna can stain many other areas and materials as well. Nails take henna very well, and henna is very strengthening and conditioning for your nails. Again, just like on the skin, you get a, a deep reddish orange close to brown color. Um, but because it's a natural plant dye, that really is the only color that you're going to get out of henna. Different strains of henna can give you a slight variation depending on where it grows, if it's a hotter climate, a drier climate. But really, you're going to get just that basic color on your skin, on your nails. Hair takes henna very well. And I actually henna my hair also. It can also stain other natural fabrics. This is a fan that I've stained with henna. It's a silk fan. So silk and cotton will take the henna dye very well. Linen will as well. But sometimes with fabrics, as you wash them, the henna stain will fade over time. You can also stain natural skin drum heads. I've done a few of those myself, as well as things on paper and wood. They will take the stain and the stain will mature on those as well. If you're looking at using henna as a craft, you can also use it leaving the paste on, on things like glass and candles and then seal those with a Mod Podge or a similar glue sealant to keep the actual paste still on. But if you're looking to use the dye, again, your skin, nails, hair, natural fabrics and fibers, and wood and paper stain very well. Here's an example of using henna on hair. So we'll talk in a few minutes about mixing the henna paste. When you use henna for hair, you're gonna mix it in a similar way than you would for using it for body art. And then you put it on your hair. You can use a um, brush that's made for using hair dye, or you can just use your hands. I recommend wearing gloves because your hands will be stained. And then you're gonna put that on and keep it on for at least two hours, typically wrapping it in saran wrap or a shower cap and putting a towel over it. Henna has a very interesting property that it pulls the heat out of your skin. So when you have it on your hair, it can be very cooling also. To get the best results out of your stain, you wanna keep it as warm as possible. So again, putting a towel over it on top of either saran wrap or a shower cap will help to keep your head warmer and keep that henna paste on longer. Once the henna paste is removed from your hair, and it takes a lot of rinsing to make sure you get it all out, but you can see this picture on the lower right. Lighter hair will dye a nice bright orangey red. Just like on the skin, the, the stain in your hair will deepen and darken over time as well. My hair is a natural medium to dark auburn brown. I use henna and indigo on my hair to get a similar color. If I had used just the henna, because um, I am going a little gray in the front especially, I get this brighter orange color. But mixing the henna in the indigo, or you could henna first and then indigo on top, gives you more brown shades. So mixing the henna paste, what do you do? What do you need? Here is a very basic henna recipe. You can just use the henna powder, water. That's really all you need to make the henna paste and get a fairly nice stain applying the henna to your skin or your hair. When I henna my hair, I only use the powder and water on my hair. Adding lemon juice to your henna for body art can help bring out more of the dye. The acidity in the lemon juice breaks down the cell structure of the leaves, which are in powder form for making the paste, and help bring more of that dye out. 
However, using something acidic when you're putting a large amount like that on your hair can be drying to your hair. So using just water works very well. I often just use water in my henna paste for body art as well. You're safest with going with either distilled water or bottled water, but tap water works as well. There are some of the different things in water that they use to soften the water and to clean the water before it comes back through our taps. Um, that could demise the stain a little bit, but it doesn't really have that much of an effect on it. So you can use just straight tap water for your henna as well. You can also add different essential oils to your henna and specific oils have properties um, of monoterpene alcohols. And I know that's kind of a fancy big word, um, but basically they do something similar that something acidic would do. It helps to break down the cell structure of the henna leaves that are crushed in that powder form and brings out more of the dye. One really mild um, but very pleasant oil I recommend using would be lavender. So you can use lavender oil in your henna. Tea tree or kajaput, which is related to tea tree, as well as nayuli. This is similar to tea tree and kajaput. I feel it has a little more pleasant scent than tea tree. Um, and you can order these online very easily. I will be sharing some links of some henna suppliers that have the oils as well. But you can get tea tree pretty readily also, and that works well in henna. I caution against using eucalyptus, which you'll often find in recipes online. Sometimes in henna kits, you might buy at a craft store like at Michael's, might have eucalyptus in them. It does work well to bring more of the stain out, but eucalyptus is kind of a harsh essential oil and can be a little bit caustic and since people are sensitive to that with their skin. So I would caution against using those and go with something milder, such as lavender or tea tree. One more thing you can add to your henna paste is sugar. And you can add this in various forms. It can be regular table sugar. I tend to use um, cane sugar. I just like the consistency it makes my paste, but you can try different things and see what works for you. Even artificial sweeteners will work as well. The reason for the sugar is twofold. The first thing that it does is pull in moisture from the air. And the longer the paste stays moist or as moist as possible on your skin, the longer the dye is going to be releasing from the henna into your skin. If the henna paste dries out right away, it's not doing very much anymore once it's dry. So that's one reason for the sugar, to pull that moisture out of the air, keep the henna paste moist longer on your skin. Also, because it's gonna make it a little stickier, it's gonna help it stick to your skin longer. The longer you have the paste on while it's moist, the longer your stain is going to last because more dye is releasing into your skin. So let's look at how to make the henna paste. I'm gonna turn off the PowerPoint for a minute so you can see the screen a little bit bigger. Can everyone see me okay? Yes, we do, thank you. Okay, thanks. I can still see the PowerPoint, so I just wanted to make sure it was working on your end. So as I mentioned, I am going to share a few links of some suppliers for henna. But when you do look at different types of henna, you're going to find different brands. This brand, Jamila, is one that I highly recommend for starting out when you haven't mixed henna before. It's very fine sifted by the producers. It is strained, so it doesn't have a lot of extra stems or sand or other things in it. Um, so it's a really good, smooth, consistent paste to try and make, or good powder to use to try and make your first paste when you're first trying it out. I use this very often, and sometimes I mix it with other hennas, and I also use this on my hair often. Um, because of where it grows in Pakistan 
and the climate there, it gives a nice reddish brown color. This is another brand. And this one is also very sifted. Um, this one comes from India, from Rajasthan, and often you'll hear it called Rajasthan henna. This is a little stringier henna, which is really interesting that different henna powders can create a paste that the consistency is different. So this one makes it a little bit stringier, which is good for laying down long, thin lines. And it works really, it, you can work with it really well after you've had a little bit of practice using henna. I often will mix these two together so it's not as stringy, but it has a little bit of stringiness to it. And again, because the little bit difference in climate where this henna grows, it's a little redder when it reaches its full maturity. So I like that color as well. Again, there's not a huge difference. You're not going to get a whole different color family necessarily, but the tones are going to be slightly redder with this and slightly more brown with this henna. But again, it's all still kind of in that same color family. So let's mix some paste. So you're gonna open your henna and following that really simple recipe, you go in quarter cup increments. You can double that, um, triple, quadruple, if you wanna make a larger batch. But starting out with just a quarter cup, give or take. And here's what the powder looks like. It's very fine, very powdery. When you first open it up, it sometimes can give you that poof of powder, so you have to be real gentle when you open it. But it washes off very easily. So sticking with the recipe, a quarter cup of powder to a quarter cup of water or lemon juice if you prefer to try something acidic. You can mix your sugar in now or you can wait until later. After we mix this paste, you're going to let it sit and mature. We have to wait for the dye to release from the paste. When it's first stirred and mixed up, it's gonna look greenish. When the dye has released, the surface will be a more brown color, so you'll know it's ready. Because our climate changes often in Michigan, our humidity changes, and that will affect the paste depending on how much sugar you put in it, you can wait until um, the dye release in your paste before you put the sugar in, or you can put it in at this stage. I tend to put it in now, but I've done it both ways. They both work well. I recommend putting the oils in at this time, but you don't have to. Again, you can put those in later. So I'm gonna add the oil, and you wanna put about a teaspoon and a half to every quarter cup. So I just use my half teaspoon so I can measure out that three times. Often when you order essential oils, especially from one of the companies I'm going to mention to you, they'll send you these little pipettes and one good squeeze of the pipette will usually give you about a half a teaspoon. So you're going to mix that in. Many people recommend using a ceramic or plastic bowl um, and a plastic spoon or whatever else you choose to stir it with because they feel that the metals in a metal bowl or a metal spoon could interact with the henna. That typically could happen if you're using something acidic. If you're not using lemon juice or something else acidic, it might not really make that much of a difference, but I tend to use ceramic bowls. So when you first mix your paste, it's gonna be this kind of lumpy mashed potato consistency. And that's about what you want to start. At this stage, you're gonna cover it with saran wrap and let it sit. Depending on the type of powder, and when you get it, you might get some instructions that will help with this, or you might have to just um, test it out and see what happens. But depending on the type of powder, you're gonna wait 
eight to 24 hours for that dye to release. This Jamila powder takes about 24 hours typically for the dye to release. The Rajasthani is much quicker. I usually have this paste ready in eight to 16 hours, depending on the heat in my home. You don't wanna overheat your henna paste. You don't wanna leave it over um, a lamp or in your oven where it would get above 70 to 80 degrees in your home because that's just going to kill the paste. So you're letting this sit. And something else you can do to help you tell when the dye is released. Once you put saran wrap over your bowl, you can set a paper towel over that saran wrap. And when the dye has released, it actually soaks through that saran wrap right onto your paper towel. So you can see that orangish brown color starting to come out on the paper towel. And that tells you that your paste is ready to now put it in your applicator and get ready to either apply it or to store it for use later. So there are many different types of applicators. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here. So there are many different types of ways to apply your henna. A very traditional way is with a henna cone. You can see that. So that's one thing we'll talk about. When you're ready to apply your design, you first want to select your design. You can Google henna designs and get things everywhere. On Pinterest, um, there's YouTube videos. You can find a lot of different books. There's a lot of henna information at libraries, so please make sure to check out what henna books they might have at the library. Um, then you're gonna try out your different application tools. There's a few different techniques depending on what application tool you're gonna use. Once your paste is applied, and we're going to show that a little bit more in detail in just a moment, you want to do something to seal that paste on your skin or be aware that it could start to flake off if you're not careful with it. And that's fine too. And then there's aftercare that you can, aftercare techniques that you can use with your henna to help keep it on and darker longer. So let's talk about the different application tools. So as I said, a henna cone is very traditional Indian way to apply henna. And it's something that you'll probably see most often if you see henna at a street fair or something like that. Most people tend to use the henna cones. They're easy to make, they're easy to manipulate. You'll also see a lot of people use what's called a jacquard bottle or a lure lock bottle. And both of these things you can order online. You can also order the cones pre-made or you can order the material to make the cones as well for many of the suppliers. These bottles are interesting because they're reusable. You just pop the top off and you can empty it out if it still has henna in it and wash it out and reuse it. So that's a great feature. They also have these different tips that have different hole sizes in them. Um, depending on the bottles you buy, they tend to come with two or three different tips and often you can buy separate tips. These jacquard bottles were originally intended for silk painting. So you could also find them through those suppliers as well. So when you wanna change your hole on your tip, you just change the different tip end there. You can also use what's um, referred to as a carrot bag, and this happens to be a Wilton brand, so you can get them at your cake decorating supply store. And these work well because it's pointed at the end. You can just cut off that tip and apply your henna like that. Or many people often use these to fill their henna cones or their henna bottles. You can get more henna in here more easily and then squeeze it into your smaller cone. 
How do you make a cone? Again, YouTube. There are so many videos out there. It's amazing. And there's different techniques for making a henna cone. You can use a triangle of this mylar plastic. Um, this happens to be florophane, which is what a lot of florists use to wrap um, their floral creations in. You can also use mylar or cellophane. You can get that even at the dollar store, the craft store. So that's one thing you can use. Triangles, there's also a technique to roll them out of rectangles. So if you're interested in trying this, I recommend Googling it and trying a couple things. You can even practice with paper first just to get the technique down. And if you've ever done any cake decorating or pastry bags, it's rolled similarly to a pastry bag. So the technique I use, I roll my tip on the long end of my triangle. So you just fold it over and start rolling and pull a little tight so you start to get this tight tip here. And you're going to hold on to that tip and just keep rolling around. And there you have a henna applicator cone, but I didn't tape it so it popped open. So once you get it rolled, There's two points that you want to tape it at. You want to tape it first where you ended off rolling it on the outside. But you also want to tape it on the inside seam here because if you don't, it could pull out and then the henna could leak from there. So there's your rolled cone. So as I mentioned, once your dye has released from your henna paste, you could take a carrot bag or even just a Ziploc bag, which is what I tend to use. You're going to spoon, oh, first of all, <laughs> I almost forgot a step. So we have that mashed potato consistency. You want to add a little bit more liquid and get it more to a thick yogurt consistency. If your paste is too thick, it's very difficult to squeeze out of your cone or your bottle to apply it. So you want to make it a little bit thinner. The thinner your paste, the more it might spread on the skin. So you don't want it too thin, but kind of a thick to medium yogurt consistency is what you're looking for. So then you're going to spoon that paste into your bag or your Ziploc bag and cut the end off and squeeze it into your cone. You only want to fill your cones about halfway so that when you fold it over, give it a little twist, you can roll the end down and tape it so the paste isn't coming out of the end. So once that's filled, it looks like that. You've got your henna cone. You can use scissors, a razor blade, even nail clippers to snip off your end. When you're opening your henna cone, start small, squeeze a little out on a piece of paper or a paper towel and see how it's coming out. If it starts to come out in curly cues, then your tip is too small and you wanna open it up a little bit more. So play with that in really small increments. You can always take more off, you can't put more back and you don't want too big of an opening because then you're going to lose control over the thickness of your lines. You can always add more paste or squeeze harder to make a thicker line, but if you want thinner lines it's harder to go backwards if you've cut too much of your tip off. There's a couple different ways to hold your henna cone and this again can be personal preference, practice technique, whatever's comfortable with you. And the size of your cone can be different too. Many people use a large cone and they hold down lower and kind of let the cone flop over. I tend to like a little shorter, narrower cone and I like to hold at the back here and squeeze with my thumb to get the paste out. So now you have your design selected. You have your paste ready in your application tool. There's different techniques that you can use. As I mentioned, you might use the bottle, so squeezing is going to be a little bit different. 
There are also henna syringes. There's no needles in them. Um, so that's a different technique where you are pushing down on the plunger on the syringe and holding it this way. With the cone, you can hold it more like a pen or a pencil, or as I mentioned, hold it up farther back. That's another part of henna that is personal preference and you have to try it out for yourself and see what works best. So now we're ready to apply. You can touch the tip of your henna cone right to your skin gently. It's not sharp once it's cut open, but a better technique is, and this takes practice, is to keep the cone above your skin slightly. Let's try that again. And I'm just gonna make a line here to show you. You're gonna pull straight up and leave it off your skin a little bit. And that can help you get nice straight lines. So you don't really want to touch the cone to your skin necessarily too often, um, but it can be a good technique for shading if you want to shade um, the center of a flower or the portion of your design. So let's try a little simple flower here. And I apologize, I can't quite see my hand and show you at the same time. So just a little light pressure and you just have a real basic small flower. As you can see, that's similar to what's on my fingers. You could also use that for a flower base and bring some petals out from that as well. And just add a few fun things, a vine, some leaves. So a real simple, small, basic henna design. Now that you have your henna applied, there's a couple things you can do. You can just leave it. Be careful not to bump it. It, the paste is going to start to set up in about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if you're outside and it's humid. Once the paste has started to set up a little bit more, you don't have to worry as much about bumping it because it's not going to smear. You might flake some of it off, but that's not a big deal. If you just leave the henna on like this and it starts to dry and flake off, don't worry about it. As long as it's been on, as long as you could possibly keep it on, you're going to get some sort of a stain. Now, if you want to make sure to leave it on longer, like several hours, you want to seal it somehow. So there's a couple different things you can do to seal the paste. First, you want to wait that 15 to 20 minutes till it sets up. You know it's set up enough that you can touch the surface it might be a little soft, but you're not getting paste on your skin and you're not able to smush it by, by tapping on it or touching it. The first thing you can do is just mix up some lemon juice and sugar, about um, half and half lemon juice to sugar. And you can dab that on top of your henna with a cotton ball or a cotton round or even a paper towel. Or you can put it in a spray bottle and spray that on. And that's gonna help keep the paste moist longer and help keep it stuck to your skin. There are other things you can use as well. You could simply wrap it in some toilet tissue, put a little piece of tape on it to keep it there. That can help to keep it on longer. But there are also some medical adhesive tapes. This one happens to be called MeFix. There are a few out there. What they're originally meant for is burn adhesive, burn dressing adhesive to hold the burn dressings on. So they're very flexible and very breathable. But once you put it on your henna paste, that paste isn't going anywhere until you take that tape off. You could also use medical paper tape. That will work as well. It's not quite as flexible, so it doesn't work quite as well as the burn adhesive dressing does um, in certain areas of your body where you might want the tape to be a little bit more flexible, like on your wrist or something like that. 
but it can work well also. So now you have your design on, you've sealed it, you've left it on several hours. I tend to leave mine on six to eight hours or a little bit longer. Often overnight is when I do my henna and, and let it sit. As I mentioned before, the longer you let the henna sit and the longer it stays as moist as possible, the more dye that's going to release into the skin and the longer your stain is going to last. So now you have taken your dressing off, you've removed the dry paste. If the paste is stuck on, now this was wet, so it came off very easily, but if that dry paste is stuck on, you can um, rub it gently with a paper towel, um, a credit card to gently kind of pick it off and scrape it off, or you can get a paper towel with some lemon juice or some olive oil on it and rub that. You wanna be careful not to get your stain wet too soon. If you do, again, it's not that big of a deal, but if you want your stain to last longest and to darken to its fullest, you wanna try and avoid getting it wet as long as possible. Now, I tend to do my henna overnight. I work with children, so I wash my hands often. So my henna doesn't always reach its mature color. This henna paste I put on two nights ago. Um, so it's getting close to its mature color, but because I've washed my hands, it didn't quite get the darkest it could have, and it's starting to fade a little bit near my fingertips. So you can see that lighter color there, but you can also see here where it's gotten darker, where maybe I didn't scrub as hard there washing my hands because it's down farther on my finger. So avoiding water, about six hours or so if possible when you first take off the paste can help it to reach its full maturity. If you want to protect it longer, so especially if you're going to be out in the sun or go swimming, things like that, you can put on anything that's like a vegetable oil based or beeswax based like a lip balm or a solid lotion, things like that are gonna help seal that from any moisture and keep your stain longer. Using lotions can help as well, just to keep your skin moist um, so that it doesn't dry and exfoliate faster. But you wanna avoid sunblocks on areas that you have henna if you want it to last longer because sunblocks can make the stain go away faster. The other thing that makes stains go away faster, much faster, is hand sanitizers. Either the liquid kind or the wipes make the stain go away faster. So, in our age of COVID-19 right now, using a lot of hand sanitizers isn't great for henna, but henna is temporary anyway, so not that big a deal. If you want to make your henna go away faster, using hand sanitizers can help it fade much faster. Once you have your stain and it's reached its full peak maturity and you're protecting it well, not scrubbing it very fast, you can get 10 to 14 days, maybe even a little bit longer from your henna stain. It's not gonna stay its deepest, darkest that long, but it's gonna stay a decent color and, and not be fading too much for that long. Um, it's rare, but I've heard some people get close to a month uh, henna on their legs or their feet because we don't tend to scrub those areas as often as we do our hands necessarily. So again, if you care for it very carefully, your henna stain can last longer. Henna is not black. You know, there are a lot of people that might be looking for a temporary tattoo that looks black, that looks like a real tattoo. If that's what you're looking for, henna is not the product you wanna use. You may see products or people doing henna where the product is labeled black henna. These unfortunately often contain a chemical hair dye and it isn't safe for your skin. As you can see in this photo, unfortunately, it has caused blistering 
and chemical burns on this person's hand. You can also see the difference in the color on the picture on the left, that more black color, and it's a flatter color. Um, it's more dull looking, um, much different than the, the reddish brown colors you get from henna. So you can really tell from the color of it, from the way it looks on the skin, it just, it looks more like it's, even though henna does soak into your skin, um, black henna looks more soaked in. It just, it doesn't have that same henna look. And it can be very dangerous. So please avoid black henna. Um, if you're wanting to get henna done and you find a henna booth, ask them about their ingredients. If they can't tell you what their ingredients are, it's likely that there are some unsafe things or maybe they just really don't know and a henna artist that's using natural products will know what they're putting in their own paste. Most henna artists make their own paste so they know what they're putting in it unless again they're using some of this chemical henna and maybe they aren't familiar with what's in it. Purchasing henna and supplies. There are many, many online suppliers that you can find henna from. You can just Google henna and you will come up with all sorts of henna suppliers. However, these are some suppliers that I recommend. I tend to purchase most of my henna powder and essential oils from the Henna Caravan and they are located in California and they have an amazing website with an unbelievable amount of products on their website related to henna. They have pre-made paste that you can order. They have the powders, the essential oils, they have design books, they have stencils, they have all sorts of things. So please, if you're looking into ordering some henna and trying it out, try them first. When I first started, I ordered some of their pre-made paste so that I could see what it was supposed to look like and the consistency, and it always is wonderful quality. One thing I forgot to mention about the paste is that henna paste does have a shelf life. So once you've mixed your paste and put it in your cone, if you left this cone out, you could leave it out on your counter for a day or two and you'll still have decent stain, especially if it's not too hot in your home. If you're staying, you know, between 70, 80 degrees. If you put it in the fridge, you're gonna get a week or two out of the dye that's in the henna. If you put it in the freezer, you can leave it up to a year in the freezer and it'll still be good when you take it out. You want to avoid thawing and refreezing and thawing and refreezing multiple times, but you could do that a couple times and you'll still have decent stain results from that henna cone. When suppliers ship you fresh paste, they will ship it overnight and they will often make it and ship it before the dye has released so it has longer time to get to you and still be a good paste. Because henna has a shelf life, you want to kind of avoid any henna paste that you might find in a store. Um, some of the Indian or Arabic grocery stores in the area, you will find henna powder, you might find henna paste, um, but for two reasons you want to avoid that henna paste. If it's all natural, we don't know how long it's been sitting there, the dye might not be good anymore. And if the dye is still good, there's probably chemicals in that henna paste, unfortunately. They might be perfectly safe preservative chemicals, um, but you never know if they're gonna be safe for your skin or not. So it's always best to go with all natural henna paste that you know where it came from. The Henna Page is another excellent resource. It actually um, has all sorts of free resources related to henna, henna on hair, henna on skin, history of henna, um, some of the more technical information about henna and how the dye molecule works and all of that. So please check that page out. The, the woman who hosts that page has just a plethora of information that she always loves to share with people. Her shop is called mehendi.com. So this is related to the henna page, but this is where you can purchase body art and hair care supplies. She also has some other interesting supplies like different soaps and perfume that's made from henna flowers and other um, body care products like that. And then a local artist who is in Ferndale, Alchemy Slow Living Studio, she does henna out of her studio in Ferndale. 
and she currently is taking a um, limited number of appointments, but she also sells henna kits. So you can get the whole kit with the powder and the oils to make your paste from her as well. And um, she's a wonderful artist and she does other interesting things as well, um, other body care products that you can find at her site. So that is my presentation. I hope that it answered some of your questions. Um, I hope it got you more interested in henna. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'll go back in a moment to the first slide with my email, but it's gildedlodahenna at gmail.com. If you have any other questions, I'd love to hear from you. So feel free to reach out. If anyone has any other questions, I'd love to take those now. Thank you so much, Honey Lynn. Uh, I'll watch our chat and Q&A in case anyone has any questions. Uh, in the meantime, I'll do a quick plug. Uh, our next program at the North Branch Library will be Michigan's Unexplained 19th Century Spirit Communicators on Wednesday, October 7th at 7 p.m. I hope you can join us on Zoom for that. Um, I'm not seeing any chats or uh, Q&As, so I think you... Uh, you have answered everyone's question. Uh, so I really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. And um, we'll be recording this. So if uh, any of you end up buying your own supplies and want to get started and want to review what we talked about tonight, um, that will most likely end up on YouTube. Um, we might even put a blurb on Facebook. Uh, so we are uh, very appreciative that Honey Lynn uh, let us uh, record that. And thank you again uh, for joining us and, uh, and uh, have a, a wonderful fall. Thank you so much.